Hi everyone, my name is Nick and I'd like to take you on a quick tour of machine learning on the lake house. We're going to start off at the home page. Here, we have quick access to things we've been most recently working on, as well as some helpful guides, link to documentation, and so on. Now, how do we navigate around our lake house? Well, if we expand the sidebar, you'll notice that we have access to a lot of our relevant tools. A key thing to note here is that we're under the machine learning persona. While many aspects are common across all users, such as data, repos, and compute, we custom tailor the user experience by persona to make workflows more efficient. Notably for machine learning, at the bottom, you'll see that we have experiments, feature store, and models tabs that we can use to jump to various useful pages. You're never tied to one persona, however, and we can seamlessly switch between them depending on what we're currently focused on achieving. Earlier, we talked about how we simplified data ops, model ops, and dev ops. So let's briefly touch on what each one of those concepts looks like within the lake house. Starting with data ops, our main repository for the data that feeds our machine learning lifecycle is going to be the feature store. The feature store makes it easy for anyone working with data to create features that can be tracked, versioned, and shared for others across your organization. This means that features can be readily discovered and reused helping ensure that you always have the freshest and highest quality data to train your models. We also provide the means to host an online feature store for workloads that require very little latency. Moving out of the feature store, let's go take a look at how we can track lineage and governance across our data thanks to Unity Catalog. Going into the Data Explorer, you'll see that we have various catalogs on the left-hand side. These catalogs allow us to assign permissions and track lineage across everything within that catalog giving us much needed control over our data from ingest all the way to serving. If we open up a table and click permissions, you'll see how easy it is to give our data engineering teams full access, but give our analyst teams read only. Then we can go over to the lineage and get a breakdown of where the data is coming from and where it's going off to. Now that we're feeling good about our data, Let's go see what developing and training models, or model ops, looks like on the lake house. A large part of the developer experience is centered around the notebook, so we're going to open one up and take a look. But which notebook should we open? Let's take a very brief detour out of the lake house and go look for some examples that might help us get started. We're going to hop over to the Databricks page for Solutions Accelerators, where we keep a collection of a lot of notebooks that were created to help jumpstart your project and show you examples of how certain common machine learning use cases are applied. You'll see there's some interesting examples such as toxicity detection in gaming, on-shelf availability, and over 50 more prepackaged accelerators that provide a great place to start on a new project. Let's pick one for recommender engines because it seems relevant to something I'm working on personally. If we open it up, you'll see there's actually three separate recommendation engine notebooks that we can pick from based on the example we'd like to follow. In our case, let's import the image-based recommendation engine and bring it into the lake house. So now that we're in our notebook, you'll see that we have a bunch of code cells ready to run. But run on what? Now we'll see another part of the magic of the lake house. Before we run anything, let's go check out the compute tab in the sidebar. This is where we can define the resources that we want to be able to allocate while in the lake house. If we go into one we've already set up, you can see that we can define aspects like cluster size and type, scaling guardrails, user access, and what Databricks runtime you want loaded. This last part is important because when we choose the Databricks runtime for machine learning, now our compute will come preloaded with many of the most commonly used machine learning libraries such as scikit-learn, PyTorch, TensorFlow, and more. Since we're going to be doing some model training, we've selected a GPU-enabled cluster, and we're letting it scale up to a maximum of eight workers. Now we can go back to our notebook where we were in before and start doing some actual machine learning. One of the first things you'll notice is that at the start, there's no actual code yet. What we're looking at is mostly markdown formatting, which lets us turn our notebooks into nicely formatted stories to guide others along our code. This Solutions Accelerator is going to walk us through the end-to-end -end process of building a recommender that uses a model trained using similarity learning, a machine learning technique for categorizing similar types of items. 
The idea here is that we're going to take a label data set of 70,000 images of various clothing items and train a model to correctly categorize a new image into one of 10 clothing categories, but without having been shown all 10 categories. This will show that the model is able to generalize well into unseen categories. We won't focus too closely on the specific implementation as we don't quite have the time, but we'll take stops along the way to highlight important areas where it really pays off to be on the lake house. So first we have to get our typical imports and pip installs out of the way. While the Databricks runtime for machine learning comes with many libraries preloaded, sometimes you need something specific or custom, and here you can pip install it right through the notebook. With the imports out of the way, now we can set up an MLflow experiment. Let's take a moment to talk about MLflow, since it's fundamental to accelerating the end-to-end -end machine learning workflow within the Lakehouse. MLflow is an open source machine learning platform that helps manage the ML lifecycle, including experimentation, reproducibility, deployment, and a central model registry. It has a thriving developer community and boasts over 11 million monthly downloads. So it's safe to say that it's an ever improving platform. Databricks includes and manages MLflow so that you can get all the benefits of this great open source ecosystem while having them seamlessly integrated throughout the lake house. So how does this work in actuality? Well, if we go back to our notebook, you'll see that after our imports, we set up an MLflow experiment in my user's personal folder. What this does is create a project where MLflow will track machine learning related events, such as model training and evaluation, and collect it all in one place so that you can track, reproduce, register, and deploy models really easily. Let's go ahead and move through a few lines of code where we're just doing some typical data preparation for our training runs and get to the first model training. Here, you'll see that we're calling MLflow to autolog. And once we actually run the cell that trains our model, we'll get a logged MLflow run in the output cell. If we click into that run, we can now see all the goodness that MLflow is tracking for us. At the top, we can see metadata about the run, such as the time, user, and what notebook was used. We can also see what parameters were involved, what model metrics were being tracked, and then a list of all the artifacts needed to fully reproduce the results of training this model. Let's take one step back out of our MLflow experiment and back into the experiments tab so we can look at another path to training models on the lake house. If we click the top button, create auto ML experiment, it'll take us to auto ML. Auto ML allows you to select a specific machine learning problem type, provide a data set and a prediction target, and give it a time limit and compute resources to automatically train models by iterating over different methods and tuning hyperparameters all while tracking the results in an MLflow experiment. Here, we're looking at a forecasting run that trained for an hour, and you can see not only the model training metrics, but also you can go into the auto-generated notebooks that were used to train the models. This saves time for both new and experienced users alike, as now you don't have to write a bunch of boilerplate code to make a solid attempt at training a model from a given dataset. So now that we've seen two ways to train our models, how do we serve them to others who may want to leverage them? MLflow is crucial here as well. We're going to take one of these models and register it to our model registry. What this lets us do is track model lineage as well as control the deployment process by tracking version changes and promotions between development, staging, and production. Once we have a model designated for production, we can go to the serving tab and deploy it for batch or serverless real-time inference. This will let our model scale up as needed and all the way down to zero to save costs. And it also goes from zero to inference faster than any other technology we've tested. Best of all, once we've deployed a model, Lakehouse monitoring ensures that all the data related to the serving of that model is stored on accessible delta tables. Not only do we provide some out-of-the-box plots to monitor how your deployed models are performing in the field, but since your data all lives in the same place, you can now join your model monitoring data to the rest of your business data for a cohesive picture of your end-to-end -end machine learning pipeline. So I hope you got a good sense of how machine learning is done on the lake house. 